Okay, so it's been about two weeks since Midnight's dropped, and I wanted to do an honest review where I got to digest the record and not lean into any extreme opinions. It's very easy to go, best album ever, 1989 is over, or that was the worst album yet, let's burn Jack Antonoff alive, when you rush out a review. And I don't care about view counts, I care about giving a fair, honest critique, which is why I took forever on Solar Power, but I have come to one conclusion on Midnight's. Taylor Swift is a mastermind genius. I praised her multiple times before on this channel, but with all the records Midnight's has broken from owning the entire top 10 of the Hot 100, making it so that no man was there, carrying Lana to her first top 5 hit, and topping 1989's opening week, a feat that many people didn't even think she could do, Midnight's is objectively probably on its way to being her most successful era yet. This is a woman who has spent 16 years in music. This doesn't happen. She is the industry. But is the music up to par with all of these achievements? Before I give my thoughts on this record and its 3AM tracks and the highly underrated Target bonus track, I want to point out three major lessons that she's learned from her last attempt at a pop era and her entire career overall. These lessons learned are why Midnight's is smashing records and further cementing her legacy. Timestamps are included in case you want to jump directly to my music review, but here are the three pitfalls that Taylor really overcame and learned from mistakes past. Breaking the poor lead single curse. For those of us who have been with Taylor since the very beginning, we can all admit that Taylor's track record with first singles off her albums has always been dodgy at best. She and her team always pick the obvious earworm and never really the most clever or brilliant songs off the record. It's a gambit that's worked over many years, but in 2019, it nearly derailed the entire Lover era. Me featuring Brendan Urie, the infamous song that it is. And a number one debut single streak that started with We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together and ended with Look What You Made Me Do. Despite a very concerted effort to get the crown, Meek just could not dethrone the monster that was Old Town Road. Her follow-up singles You Need to Calm Down and Lover also aim for the number one spot, but really stalled in the top 10, which is still very impressive, but one can't help but wonder how different Lover would have gone as an era if a song like Cruel Summer had been the lead single. Had it gone in the music video, the live performances, and the promo that Me had, I genuinely think it would have been a chart topper for weeks and a huge, big single that we'd remember her by. Choosing to not let us listen to any of the music before the release was a very gutsy move, yet Swifties went on to buy variant upon variant of the album anyway. I can't name a single artist with that level of trust from their audience. Can you? It really paid off. 1.5 million sales. On Midnight's, we got the lead single Antihero on album release date, like how we did with Cardigan and Willow. But unlike those two alternative leaning tracks, Antihero is a pop banger, and it would have been a hit record with longevity had it been released before the album. It's a charming, TikTok friendly Antonoff production that's relatable, hooky, and more like blank space than me. And it just became her most recent number one hit, her ninth to date, and her fifth debut at number one. Leveraging social media hype correctly. Taylor Swift is no stranger to social media. She's always been an innovator in that regard, from engaging fans during her debut on MySpace to taking over Tumblr and sparking memes like No It's Becky during the 1989 and rep eras, to even her odd The Swift Life app during the Reputation era. She knows how important social media can be. Which is why during the Lover era, sorry I'm gonna be picking on this era quite a bit, she sort of fumbled the bag. While she had a great build up to me and the album on Instagram and Twitter, her presence on the then rising platform TikTok was lacking. TikTok's impact in 2019 is nothing compared to the impact it has on the charts today, but it did help elevate hits like Old Town Road and Bad Guy through organic trends, using sounds, and creating natural engagement. While a Love Story remix did trend in 2020, and Swift talk was starting to build momentum, Taylor didn't join the platform until August 2021, with a video recapping her previous era's looks. Maybe a teaser towards the tour that we have today? Who knows? Midnight's generally leaned on this platform more than any of her previous records. She used the platform extensively for a Midnight's Mayhem series where she was teasing title tracks, she was liking posts made by creators. The platform really liked the mystery element of the record. 
videos of fans speculating on the sound of the record racked up hundreds of thousands of views and likes, and even post-album dance trends like this one for Bejeweled served as free promo. With Midnight's, you know that she's taken over Twitter, Tumblr, and now TikTok. Okay, so this third one's gonna be a little controversial, but it's releasing a solid short standard track list. Not many people think about this, but the decision to release a standard edition of 13 tight cohesive pop tracks, all produced by Swift herself and Antonoff, was very smart. It offered her opportunities that she wouldn't have not had had she just dropped this album as a huge 20 track record all at once. For one, a 3am surprise genuinely drove even more streams and engagement amongst fans. Luckily, I lived on the west coast so it was just a 12am drop for me. From a critical standpoint, it very much avoided a pitfall of hers that her major last pop effort and even some mixed reviews on Folklore had of the album running a little too long or having too much filler. For better or worse, the standard is relatively short, sweet, and cohesive. While I have some qualms upon listening to some of the Desner tracks on the 3AM edition, I think it was a strategic decision that overall helped the reception of the album. Compare Midnight's Metacritic score to say something like Lover. I am so sorry Lover stands, I'm gonna be dragging you. I actually think with some clever trimming and shoving some of the tracks to a deluxe version of Lover, Lover and Midnight's would have similar scores on Metacritics. Midnight's is cleverly curated and more palatable to critics' ears in its current state than Lover ever was. Track listings are a factor to winning the Album of the Year Grammy. They don't want to say it, but I believe it's true, and general acclaim. I love Red and I wish it had won, but it was way too jumbled to really stand a chance compared to 1989's similar 13 track Streamline Self. When you're someone like Taylor, you just know how to play the game right to win. And this was really why I think the track listing ended up the way it was. Which brings me to how I feel about Midnight's. I'll be honest, I was initially underwhelmed by the standard edition of the album. I thought that it felt very monotonous, sleepy, sluggish. But then it took me some time to really align myself in the mood of the record. We have to think relatively thematically, and as she did state in her initial statement with this album that it would represent 13 different restless nights, and Midnight's does actually capture that weird delirium feeling that you get when you think you've written something that's just brilliant, and sometimes you did, sometimes you did at 12 in the morning, and other times you go back and you read it and you go, ah, this is garbage, but only yourself at a state of being dreary and sleepless, can you come up with work like this? And I feel like thematically, this album really did hit the nail on the head. I will say that I really did love the first half of the album when I was listening to it initially, but I have now switched my opinion and I actually really love the second half of the album even more than the first half. I have to say that my initial standouts and the songs that I keep on coming back to would be Question, Bejeweled, I've started to really love Labyrinth, Karma. Just a really quick thing to mention, I love the fact that Taylor is still the queen of bridges. I feel like a lot of criticism for this album being formulaic is really just her adhering to the traditional pop song structure where you have a really solid bridge, a good pre-chorus, some really good build-up. I was genuinely scared when I saw the song lengths that she was going to be trendy. I like the fact that these are TikTok-friendly songs, but not TikTok songs. Meatless, chorusy garbage. Karma started off as a song that I hated because it was just lyrically juvenile, but it ended up becoming the this is why we can't have nice things off the record for me. Like, I adore it. I can't wait to see her perform it live. I was not really a big fan of Lavender Haze as an opener. It sounds to me kind of like a sequel to I Think He Knows, and while that track is beautiful and I adore it, I just felt like it wasn't the strongest opener that we could have gotten on the record, but I know why it's there. Snow on the Beach with Lana Del Rey has to be the only really disappointing track for me because as you know, I am a Lana stan, I have done multiple videos on her, and unfortunately she does not break the background singing curse that Phoebe Bridgers broke during Nothing New. I felt like she just didn't contribute enough to the track for it to really feel like a feature. It's more of like a co-write, I can hear her lyrical influences, but it just did not gel together for me. Maroon sounds like dress to me, and at first I did not love that, but then I ended up realizing this is the closest to rap we're ever gonna get, so it has become a, a slow grower of mine, but not a favorite. 
You're on your own kid deserves to be track number five. It is beautiful, poignant, it breaks your heart, it's such a brilliant song. I adore it, I can't wait to hear it live. It's just thematically one of her best songs and that bridge covers all of her eras. I know all of the nerds on TikTok are talking about it. But Question really is my favorite track so far. I just love the storytelling aspect. I love the fact that it does weave a narrative together of what could be. I love her songs about what what could have been. I feel like when she sings about that, that's her best self. Bejeweled is definitely another favorite of mine. I mentioned it earlier, but I just love how it sounds like a Bleachers track, but Taylor's version of a Bleachers track. Like you can hear the Jack Antonoff vocalisms in there. Vigilante shit was kind of a disappointment for me. It felt like a Billie Eilish take. Not to like compare the two, but it just reminded me of like Billy's first album. And I love that sound, but it just doesn't feel as fresh, though I do know it's gonna be amazing live. Midnight Rain has become a standout track of mine just because of how adventurous it sounds. I like it when Taylor delves into autotune. I really do like that hooky sound to it. But again, it is a grower of a song. Sweet Nothing with William Bowery, who's just Joe. We all know he's Joe. That song has emerged as one of my deep cut favorites. I adore that track. I like the way that the melody weaves together. The lyrics aren't really the best, but like honestly, it is such a cute track. I think it's my favorite collaboration between the two other than Exile. For all of the griping that this album kind of steals from melodrama, the only song that really felt like that to me would have to be Labyrinth, and I do enjoy that track. It's giving hard feelings slash loveless light. I do like the little synth that comes in and out and just the heavenly vocals of that track. So it is a highlight of mine. Now, you're gonna hate me, but I just did not like Mastermind as a closer. I felt like it was kind of underwhelming in a sense. I do love the track itself, but thematically I feel like Maybe Sweet Nothing should have been the album closer instead of Mastermind, you could have flipped the two. Uh, the story of the album isn't very clear. This isn't an album that has a cohesive narrative like 1989, Reputation, Lover, Folklore, Evermore. It's, it's a bit more scattered, and I enjoy that. I actually do like the fact that she took a break from having an overarching narrative and instead having this collective record of thoughts and imaginations and dreamscapes, but I would enjoy like having an opener and a closer interlock together. And Lavender Haze and Mastermind, they don't really play into each other that well as a storytelling mechanism. But then we get into the 3AM tracks, which really are amongst some of my favorite tracks ever released by Taylor. The Great War has to be one of my deep cut favorites. It's giving classic Lana Del Rey, Aaron Desner, I Missed You So Much, You Are So Good On It. Bigger Than The Whole Sky is heart-wrenching. I did not like that fans were speculating that it was about a miscarriage or a loss that Taylor had. I feel like it's a general song and if that situation applies to you and you really do feel it deeply, I, I'm glad she made music for you, but I just hate the speculation. I, I just want to say that. Paris with the Jack Antonoff production is just so fun. I totally get why they cut it from the standard, but it's just, it's really fun poppy 2014 stuff. I enjoy it. High Infidelity continues her trend of songs that are about cheating being her best songs. I adore that track to bits. It's another Desner production. I feel like High Infidelity is about her time with Calvin Harris, though honestly, I, I'm not gonna make speculations. I just felt like thematically it was about that. He finally got his own song. Glitch with Sam Deuce production and Antonoff's production. I enjoyed quite a bit. I felt like it was a little too oddball to be on the standard, but it does feel like a great extension of her like creative energy. I feel like it's a good vibey song that you can listen to on the beach, which is kind of rare. Taylor doesn't have that many beachy songs, so I'll take it. Would've, could've, should've, heartbreaking, amazing, another Desner track. This, this one would have definitely been on Evermore. It feels like an Evermore outtake, which is probably why it's not on the standard. I just want to say, John Mayer, if you're listening to this, you're definitely not listening to this. You are going to jail for what you did. The line about her wanting to get back her girlhood literally rendered me in tears. Just an absolutely brilliant song, but I definitely get why it's a 3AM track. Dear Reader honestly does feel like a real album closer to me, and I'm kind of sad that it did not make the final cut. 
I feel like overall it does capture that dreary midnight i'm imagining my life and i'm trying to put the pieces together energy that taylor wanted to have throughout the entire record i just like how it sounds though it does sound a little too similar to maroon and dress so i get why it was cut i'm, I'm just going to dedicate a whole minute to talking about this but the target bonus track hits different is the track that i honestly wanted the entire record to sound like I, I don't want to be a fake fan. I appreciate the record, but Hits Different really hits different. It is my favorite track. Go and listen to it. It is giving 2000s rom-com realness. It is giving Katherine Heigl and 27 dresses. She just got her heart broke. She's eating a cake energy. It is everything I want in a song. It sounds like debut Taylor in the best way possible. There is an earnestness to it. There is a sweetness to it. It feels like the old Taylor, but wrapped in a beautiful throwbacky pop rock sound that I can't wait for her to explore. I feel like she's going to explore the sound later in her career. It is such a good song. Go listen to it. I'm, I've been speaking about it for a minute. She needs to release it on streaming. I love it. Overall, I would say that Midnight's is an album that really is a mood-based album. I feel like you need to be at a certain point in your life to really enjoy it. And that was a similar conclusion that I drew to Reputation, which has grown to become one of my favorite, if not my favorite Taylor record. Not like objectively, but subjectively, obviously. If I had to be honest and assign the album a score, the standard version at least, I'd give it a 7.7. .7. But with those 3AM tracks, definitely an 8.3, 8.5. It feels like a really well done capstone project in which she just took everything she learned from 1989 all the way to Evermore and the re-recordings and she managed to blend it together into something new. It feels like a greatest hits album for an artist like if you gave me this album and out of context and you said these are taylor swift's greatest hits and you'd given me that album when i was a kid when she was just starting out i would have told you dang this woman the mastermind she is but when compared to existing works i just feel like this isn't her best just yet but honestly, it's a very solid effort, and I appreciate it, and perhaps, maybe when I revisit it in the future, it might become a favorite of mine, but for now, I will say Folklore, Red, 1989, you remain my trinity of albums, but Midnight's has definitely toppled Lover for me, and it's... It's on the rise, so who knows? So anyway, thanks guys for watching this video. I know that I was kind of late on it and it kind of sounds like gobbledygook, like it doesn't really have a cohesive theme, but that's how I felt about Midnight's. That's really how I felt about it. And I'm recording this, this like video with a cold, which is really insane. But you know, the things I do for love, shout out to my members, like and subscribe if you really like this content, comment below what your favorite tracks were, and I will see you for the next video. Thank you.